I'm going to talk about part two of the history of the recording industry. So where we left off, we started to see the rise of independent labels. So the independent labels started to develop in the mid-1920s. Um, these were able to uh, become a thing because it catered to specific markets instead of uh, trying to appeal to the broad landscape of everybody in America what they did was they targeted a country audience or a blues audience eventually many labels got acquired by bigger labels or went out of business by the end of the 30s Victor, Decca, and Columbia were the major companies still in business. All right, so let's talk about genre-specific labels. From the 1930s to the early 50s. So you had your popular uh, genres, which included Broadway, and what was coming out of Hollywood. Soundtracks and orchestral stuff. So Broadway type things. That was broad appeal at the time. Then with your independent labels, you saw your blues and country. These were the two main. Now, remember, 1930s to early 1950s, rock and roll didn't exist yet. So you had your American forms of blue blues and country and then a crossover which sometimes popular sometimes independent was jazz so a lot of popular artists i.e. Frank Sinatra for instance would sing behind a big band and that became known as standards but it's also in the jazz realm. So let's talk about M-O-R next. M-O-R means middle of the road. This was a term for marketing. Middle of the road. Okay. This genre of popular music was the most popular genre before rock and roll. So pre-rock and roll, popular music. Middle of the road. So what defines it? Easy listening music designed to appeal to broad audiences, especially older adults. Now, when you think of 1930s to 1950s, early 1950s, who are the older adults during that time? Well... They were born in the 1800s, right? So it appeals to them. So a lot of orchestral backing, like you see in the picture, um, and a lot of middle-of-the-road pop kind of standards. That was the popular music of the time. Big band. Okay. Okay. Let's talk about the changing industry. It's going to be the post-war era. So we talked about 1930s to early 1950s. Um, what was popular? Okay, middle of the road. That's what it was. Now, post-war era, we're talking about mid-40s. You know, so 40s into the 50s, um, to the end of the 50s. We're talking about World War II. Okay, so the post-war era saw the rise of different musical genres. Major labels were slow to recognize or record these genres. So what did this do? When the major labels are slow to recognize or record the genre, it leaves room for independent labels and independent producers. So, during the post-war era, 
when uh, honestly a lot of industries and companies are marked by this distinction pre-war post-war okay um for instance if you like martin acoustic guitars your pre-war martins are going to be astronomically more expensive than your post-war martins okay and just not as much things were produced during that era of time during the war um, that's why a lot of times it's signified by pre or post war era um, the war era you know for that five to ten years in the middle of the 30s and 40s um, there was just less products being produced for consumer market and that's because a lot of our national you know um, capacity was being put forward to the war effort so with the gap left in the post-war era um, the small labels started to eat it up now 1940s this is when you start to see the first underground music get into the pop market so 1940s R&B artists like Louis Armstrong started to cross over into the pop market. Before this time, he was considered jazz. He was not marketable to the broad audience of America, but he's one of the first ones to cross over into the pop market in the 40s. There are other artists as well. He's not the only one, um, but he's just an example. So this movement of R&B artists like Louis Armstrong um, showed a significant point um, because he sp they spread beyond the African-American population to different racial and economic groups. So different racial and economic groups were all listening to the same music. Before this time, they didn't. Now, in the mid-50s, you start to see rock and roll. It begins to infiltrate America's musical landscape. And pretty quickly, we start to see middle of the road genre be replaced by rock and roll as the most popular musical genre. Now, because many A&R execs uh that stands for artisan repertoire these are the people who sign bands these are the people who get bands recorded these are the people who get bands marketed to radio stations and uh to uh vinyl during this time many of the major labels a and r people were middle-aged had little enthusiasm or interest in rock and roll okay now, those, those people were more interested in doing middle-of-the-road stuff, more interested in doing popular music, even jazz, before they would do rock and roll. Now, this led to the meteoric rise of independent record labels. So, let's look at some of these independent record labels from the 40s and 50s. All right, ABC Records, founded in 1955 in Hollywood. Popular artists, The Impressions, Three Dog Night. Atlantic Records, 1947, founded in New York. You have Ruth Brown, Ray Charles, among others. Chess Records from Chicago. That's where you get the blues. Records coming out, 1947. Muddy Waters, Chuck Berry, but also many many others Duke and Peacock from New Orleans is where you get um, some of the New Orleans blues that was coming out at the time some of the Zydeco stuff some of the Cajun band stuff you got Bobby Blue Band as a popular artist King Records 1944 Cincinnati they signed James Brown 
Mercury Records, 1945, Chicago, uh, Patty Page, MGM, 1946. They were out of L.A., and they had Connie Francis, also had Hank Williams in their artist repertoire. Motown Records, Detroit, Supreme, Smokey Robinson's, Mar- Marvin Gaye, um, Jackson 5, many, many others. All right, Stax Records from Memphis. Um, you know, a lot of people called Stax, Motown South. Um, that's where you got to see um, a lot of the R&B and um, Motown type music. Otis Redding being the most popular. Uh, Sam and Dave bands like that. Sun Records. Founded in 1952 in Memphis as well. This is where you see possibly the most pro- prolific recording artists of all time. Elvis Presley, Johnny Cash, Carl Perkins, Jerry Lee Lewis, others for sure. Um, very influential United Artists. Uh, now, United Artists was also a studio, movie studio, so they had soundtracks and um, other bands and things like that. The Imperials, Lil Anthony and the Imperials, but um, they were considered an indie label. Warner Brothers, same thing. 1958, they founded a record label. It was an indie label out of L.A., they signed Peter, Paul, and Mary. Um, they also later had Tom Petty. Okay. Um, I'm going to go back for just a second. So, between the 40s and the earliest one we really see is 1944. It's so really mid-40s to the 50s. There is all these independent labels that that pop up and um, are very, very successful. Typically, a lot of times, these labels would then sell their contract for an artist, say like Elvis Presley, uh, to a larger label. So Sun Records very famously uh, sold Elvis's contract to RCA, Victor RCA, um, and then he started coming out with records on there, um, like uh, Heartbreak Hotel and Hound Dog and all those. Those were RCA recordings, his early recordings, um, Blue Moon of Kentucky, One Play House. All those uh, were Sun Record recordings. And they have a, a different sound. They're, they're more raw. Uh, they're less produced. When you get to the RCA stuff, you can tell it's a bigger budget. You know, But that was kind of the appeal of rock and roll, is that raw, visceral um, thing it made you feel. So let's talk about what are the big differences between major labels and independent labels. So major labels make up 75% of the music market and more depending on the year. They're linked to the big four labels, which essentially provide funding, artists, and facilities which they need. So the major labels are are responsible for all of that stuff. Um, So what are the pros of if you're put yourself in the artist's perspective, you're looking to sign a, a, a label. Say this is 1940s, 1950s, um, but all the stuff actually applies to today as well. Nothing has changed as far as the independent versus major label debate. Um, so pros, they, they have enough money to fund you. Okay. 
Uh, they'll produce high quality production packaging. Um, they'll distribute your records or music anywhere in the world, which we can all do today, but they couldn't back then. Um, but they'll put marketing behind it. And so that, you know, that costs money. Um, so digital distribution through the major online atlas, world tours, put you on a tour, shoot you some music videos. Uh, they have the money to do all that. Okay, the pros continued are networking and connections. So being well known in the business allows them to have numerous connections, which allow them to get involved in most musical outlets. It's a lot easier to do business when you know the right people. All right, they also have big size and reputation. This allows them to be dominant um, of most of the music industry, which means they overpower independent labels, meaning that artists are given more opportunities. So, in theory, you're given more opportunities than you have being an independent artist with a major label. All right, let's let's hop over and read the pros for an independent record label. So an indie label being a label that is independently funded and not connected to one of the big four major labels. Um, so pros, music rights. Artists typically keep control over their music and what they wish to do with it at an indie label. Um, belief, independent labels, unlike major labels, are genuinely involved in the love in it for the love of music because they're not making as much money. That would be the that would be the thinking behind it. So if an indie label signs you, that's because they actually think your music is good. Um, you know, not because you're a cog and we all have a big company uh, that might make them some money. Um, you know, uh, and and this is just this is just broad strokes right there's there's exceptions everywhere but typically um they'll go to fight for you a little bit more than a uh, major label will um and because of that you get close relationships with indie labels um so they tend to be uh having much smaller artist rosters in the larger major rate uh record labels um so that means that artists will work more in a one-on-one -on -one situation with representatives um, and typically have stronger uh, contacts. Uh, you'll, you'll see this a lot of times now um, from the 90s up until today. Um, a lot of times when a band signs to an indie label now, um, they'll stick with it because they have those co close relationships. That's one way um, for independent labels to be able to try to keep artists uh, away from the major record deals. Um, and then pro-artist contracts. Contracts are known to be more artist-friendly in indie labels, giving the artists more money for their work through either profit-sharing programs or simply a larger royalty percentage than given by major labels. Um, the reason why major labels can give less on that is because they put up way more money up front and a lot of times they'll give you an advance um, that you will have to pay back before you start making any more money from the label but we'll get into all that after we get out of the history of uh, the music business now let's look at the cons for both if you're a major label uh, cons uh, you're gonna have to fight for attention you're one of many artists on that roster and Honestly, if your record does not perform well, you're probably not going to get another chance. Um, even to get that marketing in the first place, to get them to put out the, the record, uh, you have to get fight for attention. Okay. Um, Artist unfriendly deals. Major labels are completely profit involved, meaning possibilities of small royalties, but means the artist does not get to keep the rights or even the creative control over the music. 
this is this is typical, right? There's always exceptions, but that's typically what you'll find with a major deal. Corporate America, all, although there are people who work within the music industry that love music, there are just as many who don't. So you're working in a more corporate setting. Uh, these people only see it as a business, and the product is the music. So if you hear, have ever heard complaints or criticism of bands becoming more corporate and major artists or major label, label deals, you know, you would hear this when Nirvana went from Sub Pop to Geffen. And, um, you know, everybody said, oh, they went more corporate, you know. Um, that's what they're talking about. Now, you know, in that instance, um, the major label actually left them alone for the most part, and they got to do what they wanted uh, for the most part. But, you know, that's what they're talking about when a band becomes more corporate. Let's look at the cons of an independent record label. So, lack of funds. Labels are not funded. Meaning smaller budget for recording, production of physical discs, packaging, distribution costs, tour support, merchandise, etc. Everything that was a pro as far as the funding for major labels is a con as far as the funding goes for independent labels. Um, typically, they're more disorganized than major labels. Um, these labels are typically informal. There's possibility of things being done incorrectly and being overlooked. And then the last con is the size. So the label itself has less influence and power within the music industry. What that means for an artist is that the small label may not be able to uh, cater to their tour and promotion needs because of their sides. Okay, so there are all the pros and all the cons of what a major label can offer versus what an independent label can offer. And a lot of artists got started on independent record deals because it was easier to get um, them. And there's a lot of local independent record labels in different scenes around the country. Um, and they typically look for rising talent. Um, well, if you sign that deal, you have to decide, are you going to stay with the independent record label or are you going to go to a major label? And that's the, um, you know, that's the dilemma. But this uh, wraps up the history part of um, the recording industry uh, and we're going to start talking about the nuts and bolts uh, next time.